Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining this workshop this afternoon. Uh, for this workshop, uh, I thought it would be an opportunity to share some uh, learning technologies that, uh, that, there, that are being used at the University of Minnesota, um, but hopefully then you can transform some of those ideas into what you do with manure, and I'm looking forward to some of the 3D modeling ideas that come out of this group after you see what, um, what this group does. I want to thank Allison Howard. Holland. Holland, I'm excuse okay. I keep doing that. Allison <laughs> no Holland. Problem. Um, Angie Gupta and Megan Weber uh, for providing this part of the workshop and then we'll have a, a second part after the break. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Alice. Sounds good. So thank you um, all for letting us be here and sharing this stuff today. Um, I'm Allison Holland. I'm an academic technologist with University of Minnesota Extension Learning Technologies. And so I get to work with people all across our extension work. So from family development to natural resources and everywhere in between. And so it was really fun when Erin came to me to try to think about who's been doing some really cool, innovative, informal learning and communications work. Um, and of course, Megan and Angie's work came top of mind. Um, just a small plug for our next session that I think starts at 340. We'll have a couple other people coming to share about how they're using Qualtrics. It's a survey platform in some innovative ways. Um, and I will also be sharing some mapping work that we've been doing with our teams. But um, so I will let Megan and Angie introduce themselves and their work a little bit more. And at the conclusion of their presentation, we will have a little um, time for conversation if you have any ideas or sharing or questions you have initially. Um, but then after that, we have three different tables set up throughout the room um, for you to kind of see their technology and their, uh, their work more hands-on and have an opportunity to ask questions and try things out. So thank you, Megan and Angie. Great, hello, so I'm Megan Weber. I'm an aquatic invasive species educator at University of Minnesota Extension and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. Um, I have to also say never at a point in my career did I think that I would be giving a talk on innovative technology. Um, so <laughs> interesting places that career paths take you, I guess. Um, but I'm here, um, Angie will introduce herself. We've kind of broken this up um, so that we'll kind of bounce back and forth through the various things. But um, she works at, with terrestrial invasive species, so we've done a lot together on working on these different things. So um, these are kind of the four um, technology tools that we've been using that I'll bring up. Um, so just real quickly, we have some interactive tools that we've been using for online learning, um, augmented reality, 360 degree imagery, also sometimes called, or virtual reality is kind of built into there. Um, and we can explain the difference. Um, we had to have it explained to us as well. Um, and then 3D printed models. <clears throat> so the first one that we have is um, looking at interactive tools for online learning. So in um, the aquatic invasive species world, we're working right now on creating this on a wholly online course to give consumers a better idea on what's happening with aquatic plant treatments. Like when you're putting pesticides in the water, what's going on? Because they don't, they purchase treatments often. So there's Lakeshore homeowners who purchase these treatments, but they really don't understand what's happening behind it. And many of them would really like the opportunity to become a more informed consumer. Um, so rather than creating an online course that's kind of PowerPoints with narrated, narration over top videos, um, I was looking for ways that we can build some fun, innovative things in that kind of get people clicking around and doing more. So um, I sent a message over to Allison and we started exploring some of these tools. And this first one that we found is called ThingLink. Um, so this is an image, I'm gonna go directly to it so I can interact with it on the screen a little bit. Um, so it's just, you can get, um, if you have um, an education system that you can get an educational license for this pretty cheap. I think we pay 25 or 30 bucks a year or something like that. Um, the downside is like the little watermark in the bottom that says thing link, like that, that stays there. That's what happens when you only pay 25 or 30 bucks. You can pay a few hundred dollars a year and that'll go away. Um, but for our purposes, um, it works just fine. But what, what we've been able to do is kind of create this visual representation so that people can understand all these different subcategories of pesticides and say like, oh, okay, so an insecticide is a pesticide that targets insects, go figure. Um, but some of these other ones that people maybe haven't heard as much about, it gives them ways to kind of know when all these other words are being used by professionals that they're interacting with, what they are and kind of helps them, you know, play, um, 
play around a little bit. I heard a statistic that, you know, the, the books that have the like lift the flap discovery for kids, that apparently that is a really good way to learn. Like this is, it makes it stick in their head. So I almost kind of view this as the adult version of like lift the flap books. Um, so that's Thing Link. Oops. I hope I'm not ruining your recording now. Um, here we go. Whoa. Okay, up there, that's the next one. So gifts. Um, if you're familiar with gifts, um, see, I see them on Facebook all the time, other places, but it turns out that they can be more than like a funny way to interact with your friends online. Um, and you can turn in pretty simple PowerPoint slides to this animated GIF that'll go through. So if I wanna talk about pesticide resistance and how that happens, there is this animation that um, Allison created this to um, that we can embed into our online course and people can kind of watch this process of how is you spray the, the, the maroon plants um, tend to survive more and take over a population. And it's this really great way to kind of, um, to, to do a low budget animation too. And so we have a couple of these built into the course as we go through. Um, and then the final one that we have is interactive timelines. And if you have questions about it, it's really gonna have to be Allison. I'm just gonna show it because I, I didn't do any of this. Um, but from a spreadsheet, she was kind of able to build in um, years and what was happening. And in the end, it creates something that looks like this that people can explore um, and go through time. <clears throat> so if we're wondering about zebra mussels and what happened and how they get here, um, you can kind of click through and it's gonna start telling you a story um, built on that. So it's it pulling in images from there and the text and arranges them really in a really pretty manner. And so it's showing here they come into North America and they're coming in ballast water in large shipping tanks. That's what the picture is about. And then now here's where they are with all the little dots across the map. Um, so another kind of interesting and fun way to think about how we can um, add some fun visual clues into what we're doing. So with that, I'm gonna let Angie chat about augmented reality. So yeah, good afternoon. My name is Angie Gupta. I'm a University of Minnesota Extension Forester out of the Rochester office. Um, but in that role, I've been in there almost 15 years now. I do a lot with invasive species over the last decade. Uh, and I started with emerald ash borer and forest pest first detector. And over the last decade, uh, we've really, really engaged in technology in a large part because we've been doing the flipped classroom. And that's, I don't know that she said that word, but that's what Megan's been doing as well. And so you do a lot of the education in the online space. And then the workshop isn't PowerPoints anymore. Now it's a lot of engagement and scenarios and stations for identification. And what that has led us to is really having to up our game in that workshop, right? When you essentially take out the PowerPoint, then what do you have? And in many ways, I view all of these tools that we've been exploring as the solution to that problem, to engage people on all kinds of tactical levels so they can do this early detection rapid response for, for species that they've probably never seen. Um, and so we'll, you'll see many of these tools. So this one, augmented reality, and uh, again, Augmented reality and virtual reality are different, and we will talk about both, but in some ways they also merge. So um, it can be a little bit fuzzy, and the gaming world is where I really think it is most fuzzy. So uh, here is a, a great video, and I think it is not playing here, so I have to exit and play it here. Um, and this was put together by our partner in this project to do augmented reality at the Minnesota State Fair in the 4-H building. And our partner was at University Printing Services and she put together this great video.
So hopefully some of the things that you noticed in that feature is the augmented reality is like Pokemon Go, if we have any Pokemon Go players out there. Um, and that's where you take a phone or a tablet and you'll be able to do this in the table in the back where Allison is. She'll be stationed there and you can visit it afterwards. But you take your phone or your tablet and you're gonna put it very much like you would a QR code over those little lightning-like spaces. And then in that, you can still see whatever's in the background. Allison's, yes, gonna be our Vanna White here. Um, perfect. So this is a piece of, anybody know what that firewood is? All right, this is a manure group. Uh, it's ash. Um, <laughs> and we're really worried about it because of emerald ash borer, right, which can hide under the bark in ashwood and move around and be a big problem. And so a lot of people can't quite envision how the larval galleries can persist and be really invisible to the naked eye from the outside. And so you can do the Zapper app, and then what happens is it essentially peels off the bark, and in this augmented space, um, overlaid on that, on your device, uh, you can see the larval galleries, and if you look really closely, there are two emerald ash borer larvae in there. And then, from an educational component, on the screen, on the device that you're using, you can do various educational things. So for this one, emerald ash borer, you can click in and see a video. So it'll immediately take you to a YouTube video about emerald ash borer. Um, for some of the aquatic ones, you can sort of swipe over, touch a, a space on your screen, and then information about that invasive species shows up. So we view it to be a really great um, tool to engage people and to get them to see some of the hazards and things that look very benign and to do that um, in a safe way. The other thing really nice about um, augmented reality, like many of our tools, is that they can be moved around. So my, mine has been autoclaved, so everything's dead in my piece of wood. Um, but by and large, you can move it around and not have to worry about seeds or things getting funky and going Going bad. I mean, you're in a virtual space, so it gives you more flexibility. And the other thing about that that number, I think it was we estimate about 14,000 people go through that. You may want to correct me. I think think that's what it is. Um, that space at the state fair at the 4-H building. And so um, we thought this was a great way to really get invasive species on the minds of a lot of people that maybe it isn't um, at, the, at the top of mind. And the partnership with 4-H, I thought was really good. So update. Uh, we'll be there again this year, 2019. We're back. <laughs> Um, so if y'all haven't seen it and you want to, State Fair is always great, but make sure you check out the 4-H building. All right. Um, so here are some additional images, and this is what you'll see in the back. We have both of those. Uh, and so it just takes a phone, and the Zapper app is free, and you can download it from your uh, Google Store or your, your um, App Store for free. And then they have the interactive pieces there. All right, so some pros and cons. So it's a great engagement tool. It's super fun and new. You can get a, f a few key educational points, right? You cannot overload them with all of the details and all the background. You don't have space or capacity for that. You can link to other resources. That's actually really slick and seamless. Um, and I think there are kind of limitless possibilities. The cons are you have to have a device and you have to have an app. Right, and so lots and lots of people have the device now. They may be less enthusiastic about downloading the app. As you can imagine, it takes a little bit of data, right? It's better if you do it on wireless. Um, it is a little unfamiliar and intimidating, so if you were to go back and watch that video, you might notice that about every person manipulating the tablet was a kid. <laughs> right, um, now again, we were in the 4-H building, so maybe that's to be expected, but I think kids have way less intimidation with technology. So, you know, you hand them a tablet and they take it and they walk over there and they play with it and things, you know, happen. Um, and so for certain audiences, I think this is really intimidating, and for other audiences, this is like Pokemon Go, right? Like, they're on it. Um, you do have limited space, and so you have to be really specific with your key educational points. And then, uh, I think we can all say safely, none of us in the room can do this, right? So we worked with University Printing and Lisa Anderson, and she made the magic happen. Um, so what that means is she did the actual augmented space for us. It, when there is a graphic, so a drawing, um, a, a cartoon type, she did that all in a digital space. So my recommendation is you hire a professional. All right, oh, 30, oh, look, I totally got that wrong. 320,000 visitors, I would expect. And then the Zapper app analytics, 3,840 uh, 3, zaps total. And so we were able to track that on the back end and look that up after State Fair. 
Um, okay, but this is what I feel like my day goes really well. So if you notice in the top left-hand corner, this was um, our Dean of Extension, Dean Bev Durgan, who posted this on her Twitter account. If you know the people in the image, it is the president of the University of Minnesota, President Kaler and his wife, and they're engaging with our uh, Play Clean Go sign. At the base of the sign is a boot brush. The boot brush in augmented reality has wild parsnip and garlic mustard growing out of the brushes. Right, so I feel like when your boss shares it and the picture of her boss is on there, your day's going well. <laughs> All right, and then just recently, in about the last month, this project won a national award from the Minnesota or the Association of Natural Resource Extension Professionals. Uh, so we were really excited about that because it's such new technology. It, it's been um, interesting to have to try to even articulate it and share it with people. So we were pleased. Did you want to talk about how it's new to for the three D overlay? Like that it's not on a printed thing? You better do I'll that. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she's making perfect sense. Yeah. The like the whispering oh, of like yeah, hey yeah. hands. Yeah, now she knows. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So um so last thing I was telling her the other the other really neat thing about this and the way that we had applied it is that typically augmented reality is like on print material. So you like get a flyer or you get a book and you're like watching something on the page come to life. So creating something new that overlays onto a three-dimensional object, so like getting an image to wrap over the log in the back, was a really new and innovative way to use augmented reality. So that's um, maybe the other thing about like really be sure you're hiring a professional because if you want to do it the way that, that we did as opposed to like using it on a piece of paper, it might require like that extra special skill set. Um, but moving on to the next step, um, we also had 360-degree imagery. Um, and this has been a really fun tool to explore, and this is kind of where um, that shift from augmented reality to virtual, virtual reality happens. Um, so when we think of augmented reality, you can kind of still see, so like through the tablet, you're still seeing the real world, right? So like that log is actually here, and you can see it, but when you're looking at it through your phone, it's overlaying something virtual on top of it. In virtual reality, the real world is disappearing, and all that you're experiencing is what's in that image and the 360, degree, the 360 degree camera and imagery is a way for that to happen. Um, and so one of the, the reason that we had kind of chosen to do this, I'm using a, an example from the world in aquatics, is that it's, it's really hard for people to understand like what things look like underwater when this is the view that we experience the aquatic world from in most cases. Like most people aren't scuba divers, not a ton of people I know are like avid snorkelers in Minnesota lakes. Um, it's, this is just kind of what we see. So when I'm trying to do education about aquatic invasive species and how they're, and how they're impacting the aquatic world underneath and what that habitat looks like, it's kind of challenging to get people to understand visually how that habitat structure has changed. So having something like a 360 camera where someone can get into the water while still wearing their office clothes is a really great, great way to, to be able to bring them there. And you know, other challenges that we see, um, Angie had mentioned last time, both she and I, when we're doing our education, it's in the off season. So it's a time when there aren't leaves out, um, there might still be ice on the lakes. So it's, it's really not a great time to go out and experience these things. So this is a way to experience summer in the middle of winter when we want to be teaching people about these things so that they're ready for summer. So, um, what we use, this is, it's a GoPro that we use. There's other cameras that do it. Um, this one happens to be waterproof, which is why it was particularly appealing to me. Um, but it's, this is, it's a Fusion is the name of the camera. Um, and we brought it. So during the kind of like play with the stuff we brought time, um, I'll have it set up on my camera. You can kind of see what it looks like and what it does. But um, as you can see from the, the image of it kind of on its side, so it has these two cameras and it's simultaneously capturing um, 180 degrees of image on each side and then it kind of like stitches together a seam where those two cameras meet <clears throat> and it allows you to, to, to capture images like this. So this is, this is our test run so just FYI like this is not an edited video and the audio is like what it's actually like the first time I put a camera in the water. So, um, oh, sorry. <clears throat> I'm just going to pause it real quick because it's a little bit easier if we slow it down, which makes the audio even more weird. Um, oh, yeah. We'll just do that. Then you don't have to worry about it. Okay. 
<clears throat> so the other challenge you'll notice, like you're staring at my face right now, um, is that this communicates so your phone is kind of the remote control. Um, I don't know how much you know about Wi-Fi signals, but they don't transmit through water. So I have to start it manually on the camera and then stick it underwater and kind of hope that I'm getting what I want. I'm working on a way to fix that. Um, I found um, through the use of Google that you can create an antenna using a coax cable. So I'm, I'm gonna learn how to do that. Um, but until then, this is what I have. So once I get a chance to do some editing, you'll see more. But um, so here we are about to go in. Um, I'm laughing, talking about how I don't wanna drop my camera in the water. <clears throat> So now as it starts to go down, this is where you kind of get a chance. So this is all Eurasian water milfoil that you'll start to see. Um, and in um, YouTube has this capability in it where I can um, click and I can control now which way I'm looking. So I can do some 360 degree exploration. I'm gonna shove the camera straight into the lake bottom so it's gonna get real dark. But um, that's, it's a challenge of not being able to see what the camera sees. Um, It'll come back up again, but this is kind of like that first step that we found of this really neat way to use a tool like this to get people to explore an area that you can't physically get them to and to see what's, what's actually happening here. So it'll come back up out of the weeds now and you'll see some more ice and, and then we'll come back out. So, um, so that is, get out of the full screen view. Um, that's what the videos are like. <clears throat> um, and then you can also do work with stills. So these are some images um, from Angie's Forestry World um, that are now hosted on the Extension website. And there's two where there's, um, this first one is an Oriental Bittersweet Invasion. Um, and it's just, it's the same, but it's a still. So it gives you a little bit more time to control. So an idea here might be to test people's ability after you've trained them how to identify something to actually find it in the wild when it's mixed in with a whole bunch of other stuff. So as you click and can kind of search around in here, you might um, oh, notice that there were yellow berries here and that that might be the oriental bittersweet. Um, this one, so the other thing that this one, these um, viewers can do, when you come up, um, this table here is where we'll have that. Um, it has, is anyone familiar with Google Cardboard or some of the other um, like augmented or virtual reality glasses? You can like put your phone onto this glasses thing and look around and it's like you're in it, you know, let people take videos of you looking weird, like you're trying to explore something that isn't actually there. Um, if you click this little thing in the bottom, that kind of creates it so that the image is available for that type of a viewer um, and it allows you to enter that, that virtual space. So you can either view it 2D through the viewer or here we go, Angie. Oh, I think you, your picture is actually in here too. So yeah, so there's Angie, you know, like looking at things that aren't actually there. And, um, but, but they're there for her, because they're in the glasses. Um, so, so you snap your phone onto there, and then you can view and explore, and as you move your body around instead, then it'll kind of get you through that virtual world. All right, um, so then same with this one, some of the pros and cons. Um, as I mentioned, I think some of the great things are that you can look at the images and things that are happening anywhere and at any time. Um, it's possible to get some really good images. It does take a little bit of playing around to learn what the best way to do that, especially if you're in um, spaces that maybe it's not used as much. I don't think the fusion has been used that much underwater. So um, just kind of figuring out what the best way to capture those images are. It's really great for practice of identification, like in the images that Angie had. Um, the glasses are pretty inexpensive. I think the cardboard is a couple bucks and the nicer plastic ones are 10, is that right? Um, 15 last week. 15 for the plastic ones. So it's something that's pretty easy to have kind of like a kit that you can bring with you at low cost. Um, it's pretty fun, cool, engaging, um, and easy for users. The, the downside was that um, the cameras can be more expensive. I think that camera was, once you got like the, um, the extra batteries and the SD cards and such, I think it was about a thousand bucks. Um, as you can see, it's also easy to get bad images. So like you can get the good ones. It's really easy to get ones that aren't that useful. I took it out to try, it, has anyone seen in the news the goldfish invasion in Chaska? Okay, so I took it out there to try and get really good images of 
the goldfish, and I will tell you it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of sorting through because I have a lot of really bad images. So it's possible, but I'm hoping that like my gem is in there too. Um, and then there's there can be again kind of that same learning curve. Yeah. Um, just quickly, did you use the same um, GoPro for the video and the? Yep. It's the same one, so it does have the capability to do both stills and and video. Um, it can do like a snapshot series too. You can you can set it up to do time lapse, so it can do all sorts of neat things too. My phone is how I control this. So this is the camera that we're using to capture that 360 degree imagery, um, and it's just the app. It's the one that comes with. This is a GoPro, so it's the GoPro app, um, and it allows me to view what the camera sees. So as I turn. Um, my phone is going to show me everything. Um, you can capture the one thing to keep in mind is that it has stitch lines, so it has this blind spot that kind of makes this curve around it. Um, so like if I were to place my hand here and kind of view it on my phone, um, you know, like there might be a line through my fingers, like the tip of my thumb might be missing. But as you move further away from the camera, then that stitch line becomes less and less significant. So for like large rooms, you'll hardly notice that there's a line there at all. Um, but then from the camera, I can control it, or from my phone rather, I can control the camera. So, you know, I could go um, off camera or hide under a table and tell it to like take a picture or start your video feed. Um, and then I can do the previewing here too. Um, the previewing is best done on a desktop because the desktop kind of lets you unfold that 360 degree image and see it all at once. Versus if I want to preview on my camera, then I still have to stop and kind of like turn around and try and find what I'm looking for. Um, but then the other thing that you can do once you've taken your image, um, you can put it in and you can turn it into this virtual reality world. So um, these are kind of just the virtual reality viewer goggles. Um, and we have, um, I'm just gonna scan a code to bring me to the website with one of our images. So once that comes up, um, you can click and it turns it into, like there's two ways to view it. So if you don't have a viewer, we have this set up so I can just look at my phone and do the same as I was before and kind of explore as is. Um, but it also has a little symbol I can press that turns it into the two um, view form. And, Then you just snap it onto a pair of the goggles. And once I look through here, now I've just kind of entered the forest. So I can explore and look up and I can see the sky up here, or I might be able to see the berries I was looking for here, um, which of course looks ridiculous to anyone else in the room, but like I, I can see all the things that I'm pointing at. So, um, so that's another kind of fun way that, that we've brought stuff in into the classroom. And I'll just add while we're still on the virtual reality, so we are working on a project, a proposal went in yesterday um, to study the a academically how people are using these tools and how they can influence their perceptions of management. But we, I ended up getting essentially almost a gaming team together because it turns out you can put attributes of augmented reality in your virtual reality still and video images, right? So you can direct people to move in the virtual reality space to a link or a tap. Um, like augmented. So they're different technologies, but they merge. And I think, again, they're merging most efficiently in the gaming world. And my experience with gaming is just hating my kids on the computer, the, the TV all the time, right? So that's the extent of my experience with gaming. But we're working at it, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're starting to explore how to combine some of these tools, too. All right. So um, in many ways, this is actually where we started. Um, so, uh, again, we do a lot of early detection invasive species training in winter when our audience says, hey, we're not in the field, we would like to learn about these things now when we're not so busy. And that's super great and all, but alas, nothing is green in the middle of winter. Um, and so it was really hard. So sitting around at lunch one day, we were, um, some, some coworkers, colleagues and I were like, I wonder if you could just 3D print some of this stuff. And so on this path we started, and it turns out the answer is you can. So over there on the, the front table um, nearest the open door are several examples. So these are all three 
3D printed models that we have. Um, this one is our first 3D printed model, and so it's all one single piece of plastic, and then it's been hand painted on top. And this is Grecian Fox Club, and these two are Palmer Amaranth, but you can see um, having a bit of a learning curve with Palmer Amaranth. So um, Palmer Amaranth is a plant that the petiole is often longer than the leaf blade, and that's causing us a little anxiety because it's a it's pretty heavy, and so we're trying to sort that out. So this is. This is 3D printed model one, um, and then this is 3D printed model two of the Palmer Amaranth, and we're a lot more pleased with this one, but we are getting another one that has slightly longer petiole length. So um, you'll also notice that all of these are, oh, have been hand painted, um, and so our artist gets a plastic composite and then she hand paints the scientifically accurate flowers, and she hand paints the chevron and the different colors on the leaves. And so this has been a really great tool for us to educate about early detection invasive species. We have fish as well. So um, these are, we have both native and invasive fish. so that we can educate people during um, the off season, so in winter when they want to learn about it and be educated because they're not in the field. But uh, our fish are really hard to get and our plants are dormant. So this has been a really helpful tool for us to use. And then all of these species are often these species are regulated, so you can't even move them around legally without special permits and paperwork and yada, yada, yada. So plastic is easier. Um, all right, so here is what the process looks like. So again, we went out, um, did a little searching and investigate and found an artist who um, had her background in displays, right? So think of museum displays, but she had really wanted to do more with this digital modeling and 3D print work and she just really hadn't had the opportunity. And so we hired her and Carlin does a lot of work for us now. And so in the left, she actually builds all of these models in a three-dimensional sculpting software. Right? Um, and so interestingly, we need them to be scientifically accurate, like super critical for us, right? And so it has really put a lot of onus on us to have really great pictures or press samples because all of a sudden she comes back with questions you never thought you would need to know the answer to. Like, is the petiole length on the male flower different than the female flower? And you're like, dude. Never looked at them that closely, right? <laughs> um, but when she's trying to sculpt an actual plant, she really gets into the nitty gritty. So it turns out it takes a lot of time to help her get it correct. Um, and it turns out what we really learned is we don't know if it's correct until we get the final product. And then there's like a visceral response like, yeah, that's good. Or, uh oh, something went wrong. But she does the original sculpting. We review it several times. She emails it to a printer, a printer prints it, and then either gets it delivered or mailed to her, and it comes as a plastic composite of some sort. And we've been on quite the curve, a learning curve, about what types of materials to use and what printers to use. Um, and it turns out she's, I think, on her third printer that she's been working with. She subcontracts them. I don't actually know these people. Um, and we are trying some new different types of composites and epoxy to work on some durability issues. And we, we thought we were golden with our most recent model and then apparently it melted last week. So still got some, some stuff to work out. Um, and then finally, the one on the right, is she then hand paints them. So she gets the digital 3D printed model and then she does all the hand painting. And so that's how we get um, the colors correct. And it turns out we have looked at color printing. You, this is how like action figures are made, um, but they can only print each individual part has to be entirely one solid color. And so if you imagine those Grecian Fox Club flowers, you cannot do that level of detail in, a, in any of the color printers um, that I'm aware of. And it, truthfully, it turns out almost no one in the Twin Cities or Minnesota maybe has a color printer that could even attempt it. So then there's that. All right. Um, so here are pros and cons. So we currently at the University of Minnesota Extension have about 20 of these models for sale that we would be delighted to sell you. Um, anywhere from three to $500 uh, for all the species that we already have available. So uh, I think that's a relatively decent selection. So you know, this actually started way back in the day out of a conversation about can we get new silk flower species made? Because we have some invasive plants that are in silk flowers, isn't that slick? So I called around and they were like, yeah, we can convince the, the, the factory in China to switch them over if you're willing to buy 10,000. I was like, yeah, no. Um, so you know, one or two at 300 seems like a pretty good deal. Um, it does take time for new species and for the first order, because again, she has to get it printed, she's got to hand paint it. Those first species take a lot of time to get, get the accuracy 
um, and the durability the way you want it. We can do custom orders for a small finder's fee, and we finally have our first cu uh, custom order in, so we'll work through that process. Um, for several of them, we've had really great success with durability. The Palmer, if anyone, is anyone familiar with Palmer amaranths? Okay, so a couple. The petiole length is longer than the leaf, as long or longer. And so what that means is you have a whole lot of weight at the end with that heavy leaf, and that's been causing us all kinds of headaches. Most of the plants, it's been really easy. That one, we're still working on durability. Realistic, so ours are all true to size. They might be relatively small plants, but they are, they are life-size plants. So you can find them in the ecosystem at those sizes, so that's really great. They are physically beautiful. People treat them with a fair bit of respect. Um, and so they've been really helpful in our early detection identification workshops. Um, and then the custom orders cost a bit more. That's the other con. All right, so with that, I actually think we're doing pretty well. Um, are there any, yeah, Allison's coming up. I was just, while you're thinking about any initial questions, um, I just want to add to, so some of those price points feel a little steep and I work with people who have ranges of budgets and this team in particular is really good at grant writing and finding additional money um, but if you're trying to to prove a concept there are less expensive ways to get started like you can download a free or very low cost app on your phone to stitch together individual images to make a 360 still life um, Try to think what the other point I was going to make about that, but oh, I I lost it. But um, so there are less expensive ways to get started with some of these things. So please don't let those numbers scare you. But they are really good um, numbers if you are looking for grant projects and that sort of thing. Um, so I don't know how chatty this group is, but we would. I know this is not your particular content area, but we're really hopeful that some of these ideas will spark some interest for your content, for the work that you do. So we'd love to hear from you about anything that it, it sparks as a, a question or an idea or things you want to ask this team to just better understand what it is that they shared. A lot of content in a short amount of time. So we'll try to take a deep breath and kind of pause and think about what, what might come to mind. Yeah. I'm just interested in the learning curve as the person behind it. Uh, specifically, the 360 camera, for example. Mm -hmm. What's the learning curve on that? Um, I I say it's it's not horrible. Um, there it, there's a little bit of one, and um, it, there's a trend where instruction manuals don't actually have words in them anymore. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that, but I've noticed it in like everything I do. The instruction manual for that, that comes with it, does not have any words. Um, you can find one online and download it, and then it becomes much easier. Um, but it's, I mean, like it's an app, you have to connect it up. Um, I don't know, Amy picked it up really quick too, so. Um, and yeah. I think that the app on, so it's an app on your phone that you use as a remote, mm -hmm. and it also not, it, I don't believe it used to when we first got it about a year ago. Um, I don't believe it stitched together in that system and you had to first put it on your computer and you had to download this uh, system on, or software on your computer from the company and then you'd stitch it together and it took all this time. Well, they can do that in the app now. So I would say that the learning curve is lessening as their systems are improving and the technology keeps getting pushed out. I did remember that other thing that I was going to say is can start less expensive. So the um, the augmented reality work, she was doing some really robust and interesting work with um, physical space and, and um, uh, imagery that we didn't have existing, but some basics could be done without a professional. So. And, and I'll say, uh, go ahead. <laughs> yes. um, so the 360, you can actually do some of this on your phone now. I mean, you can download an app. Some of the new phones is actually included in your camera software. Um, when when I tried it in my office, it wasn't it wasn't good enough quality for what we needed. Um, but it's free and available. So if you don't need super high quality, what your phone can do for free may be sufficient for the 360 virtual reality stuff. Um, yeah, and maybe maybe the other point, um, if you if you don't have to put the camera underwater, there are less expensive cameras. Yeah. 
that would be cool. Yeah, Julie. I think for the 360 with your camera, if you're going to put it on a tripod, mm -hmm. like if you're out in the woods or if you're in a building or something and you want to do a 360, you could buy a selfie clip for your camera on it that adheres to or hooks onto a normal tripod. And then you can easily just turn it without having it going like this along mm -hmm. the way. So I've had good success with that, with looking at plants in particular in trees. That's a good point. Lungs are all the same height. <laughs> <laughs> and like this one, because it does all the images in one, like we do put it on the tripod and then so with like the oriental bitter sweet try to stick it in the middle of something and then I would like hide until I could see on my phone that I they could see me on the camera and then I press click. But <laughs> yeah, otherwise you can move around with your camera. Yeah. How, does, how does the camera handle like dark situations? Is it okay in the dark or? Yeah, I mean, um, that the video that you saw was taken under like 16 inches of ice. So with a bunch of snow yeah. on top. With snow on top, yes. Um, so so yeah, like decent darkness. Um, I'd say it's a little bit great. Like I don't think I could pull a still out of that video, but as far as like exploring within a video, it, it's enough quality for that. Yeah. So when you're trying to find a um, someone to help make the three D models, what do you search? Let us know and we'll, we can put you in contact. She can, she can do more than like fish and um, plants. I think actually the link, there's a link there, right? So there's, there's, there's a referral form on our page that'll get you straight to her. Um, it's geared towards invasive species, like what species are you interested in? But like if you're talking about like a manure display, like you said, like I'd, I'd like you to make a 3D print of manure, like she'll, I'm sure she'd be happy to try it. Um, but it's a specific skill set that for oh, other people that are in other states, for example. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So she, yeah, she, she, she is in Minnesota, so it's nice because like she can drive it straight to us. Um, she's, a, she's a scientific illustrator by trade um, who happens to be really good at digital three-dimensional modeling. I honestly don't know what the name for that skill is. I mean, I think a graphic designer yeah, might just be it. What you said, I think those are all good keywords to search. <laughs> and also, I think this team originally started with um, somebody on our campus. So we knew that the College of Liberal Arts had invested in some of this technology and was knowledgeable. I also know that the School of Design, or the, oh, I don't know. The medical school. The design area has some 3D, the medical school may too. So sometimes it's worth just kind of seeing who within your yeah. university system or you know the other professionals in your area, even if they have very different um, content areas, they might be able to connect you with somebody that could get you started. I will say though, I was the one who made a number of those calls to other departments in the university, so like UMD, University of Minnesota Duluth, and the medical school and the bunch, and a couple of interesting things came out of it. One, they had never seen prices as low as we were getting quoted to do 3D printing, so that was interesting. And over and over they kind of said, well, you know, I do brains, I don't really care about invasive plants. So even if I could do it, you're not going to really reach to the level that I would spend my 3D print time on your project. And so that was an interesting thing um, from the university. And in the natural resources, I'm unaware that anyone has a 3D printer. So um, there was all of that. I would say her artistic skill as an artist, and she has specialized software to do this. I mean, I don't know that we could do this on our desktops. I feel confident I could not do this on my yeah. desktop. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I don't know if, like, if any graphic designer can do that. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was some searching, and I think it happened to be that the person that we found was in Minnesota. Um, but I mean, that doesn't mean that there aren't other people who could. This is another space where I, we feel like we're solidly in like, kind of the front of what's happening. If we have a little, yeah. little I'm going to go, we're not really talking about these things, but I think they're fun and I'd like to share them with you. So, um, enter. Oh. Okay, so over on the right, there are a couple of banners, and these are just educational banners we use again for invasive plants. Um, so the life-size Palmer Amaranth Mature, and then to scale the giant hogweed. And I think it's just an innovative way to use what is often a marketing tool in education. Um, and then this one, Palmer Amaranth Library Kits, so this is available at your public library. You can get it on interlibrary loan for free. 
Um, but it is just a way to put education into the hands of anyone who might want it through the public library system. And so um, nothing super innovative about the materials themselves. I think it's the distribution system in this one that's a little bit more interesting. So if you're interested, Palmer Amaranth Kit, home base Rochester, you can interlibrary loan it. <laughs>